Hi brothers and sisters, we're back to take um, a continued look at the weave in the web of lies uh, that we've been, you know, discussing, I guess. And uh, we're going to link that to a verse here. We'll take a look at the verse right quick and we'll, we're going to take a look at the peacock angel this time. And this is what the verse is. It's Isaiah 25. <clears throat> We will start in verse 7, and it says, He, no, she will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people in the veil that is spread over all nations. So let's get a couple other renderings on this so we understand what it's saying. On this mountain she will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. So you're in darkness is the idea. On this mountain she will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples in the sheet that covers all nations. So we're talking about the web of lies, the veil of lies. And it is a thinly spread veil of lies when you get understanding that. That it's actually referencing um, lies that were weaved together. All right. Um, and so verse 6 of Isaiah 59, just for a quick reference, this is their webbed shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. For their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, and neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold, obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. And we do. As long as this web of lies, they can hold together. It, it can't create a garment, any, a body of eternity. And this web of lies, this weave of lies is covering all nations of the world. And we've been looking at some of those topics, such as Lilith was one that we looked at. And uh, we really said, really what they were referencing was Lily, the lilies of the covenant. When you get looking at um, the, the Bible that we read, uh, and there is many passages that speaks of the lilies of the covenant. David speaks quite a bit about them. And then with Lilith, uh, she apparently shows up in the, the Talmud, I think. Um, so she's part of what uh, the Jews or um, um, the Hebrews uh, believe, Israelites, whatever you want to call them. Um, I don't think they're Jews. I think they're Israelites is what I think. Or the Hebrew people. Uh, Jews was just referencing one group of them. Um, but yeah, so we see this Lilith and we see the Lily. So we discussed Lil Lily. Now we're going to, Lilith, on the last video, sh sorry. And now we're going to look at a weird topic. And it's Yazidism. And it's what the Yazidi people, uh, the Kurds, believe in. And we're just going to read a little bit. And we're going to see how this web of lies is actually being connected through many, many facets of our existence. If we want to get smart about it and start really looking into the truth, we begin to see it fall apart. And it does fall apart once you realize this web of lies um, that these wicked sons of Belial uh, weave together over our world, this web of lies that can't hold together. And so here we'll begin Yazidism. We're in Wikipedia. Um, Kurdism or Sharfuddin, it says, Kurdish, is a monotheistic ethnic religion followed by the mainly Kermanji, I think of Germanji, I'm thinking there might be a connection there somewhere, um, you know, uh, underlying that we don't fully understand. So followed by the mainly Kermanji speaking Yazidis, and it's based on the belief in one God who created the world and entrusted it into the care of seven holy beings, known as angels. So we saw the one who gives birth to seven. Seven, and we identified it as daughters. That's right, the seven daughters 
who are actually your seven archangels, also was known as the presence of God here on earth, known as the camp of Mahanaim, and they are clearly identified as female. So they were entrusted it into the care of seven holy beings known as angels. So we're seeing there's some line up here, is what we're, we're saying. So preeminent among these angels is this angel no, known as the Tawasi Melek. Now I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm probably not. And also spelled as Melek Taus, who is the leader of the angels and has the authority over the world. Now I'm going to tell you this angel, I think, is actually Ariel or Uriel in her anger, or Israel, the daughter Israel. That's who this is. And she was gave full authority over the world. What that meant was she brought the law of heaven, the law to this kingdom and how it was to be ruled. And it wasn't her subjecting herself to him and him to her. It was, well, yes, it was. It was exactly that. But it was one out of love, right? It was not one over the other, okay? It was the laws of God is laws of equality. So this is all to do with this web of lies that we see that has been weaved around the globe. Um, okay, now, we'll go down to principal beliefs because we want to hit this pretty quick. Nah, I can't remember where it was exactly. Okay, so we'll read the principal beliefs. Yazidis believe in one God, whom they refer to as, and I won't give the name, but basically it's a king. Well, that all lines up, right, with every other web of lie that we've hit. Um, and less commonly, and it gives two more names here. According to some Yazidi hymns, I won't go into this part, we'll skip it. In Yazidism, fire, water, air, and the earth are sacred elements that are not to be polluted. Well, we saw the water seriously polluted, we saw the fire seriously polluted, and then by, by extension, we do see the earth and the air, the spirit, polluted, fully polluted. So we saw all four actually being polluted by the religious line law. So during prayer, uh, the Yazidis face towards the sun, for which they are often called the sun worshippers. Well, we were never supposed to worship the sun. We're supposed to worship God, our true creator, and by extension, the truth of God. So, the Yazidis myth of creation begins with a description of the emptiness and the absence of order in the universe. Well, I would have to say, we're actually leading back to um, chaos. We're leading back to complete disorder. Nothing making sense in this creation that we are living in. So, prior to the world's creation, God created the white pearl in a spiritual form from His. Yeah, His. Again, we see this he pronoun all over the place. This is all part of the web of lies we've discovered. So from his own pure light and alone dwell in it. Now we saw Israel being referred to as the light of the world. She's also called God on this earth and she because it's the daughters of Israel that were, were God and then we get the sons of God which were actually the sons of Israel. And, uh, so, and, I mean, we discover this by hard study. We don't get it just dropped into our lap. You actually have to go in. You have to look at it and study. You have to reason with the Holy Spirit. Um, you're not going to read commentary because this is all part of the web of lies. Um, you're going to have to reason the truth out through the Holy Spirit. So, um, first there was an esoteric world, and after that there was an exoteric world. So, I think it's saying... We see the inner being, then we see the outer being, is what we see. So, um, before the creation of this world, God created seven divine beings. Okay, I already did this, right? And so, it was assigned to Tawusi, Tawasi Melek, the peacock angel. So now we're going to go down here, and we're going to read a little bit on the... I don't think we're going to read the seven angels. Um... Maybe that is where I want to read. It's hard to remember. Um, yeah, right here. So it is Tawa, excuse me, Tawasi or Tawusi Melek. So that's to say the peacock angel. And we're going to see some curious facts here begin to line up with the character of Lilith. So here we're seeing actually the web the web of lies 
coming together. All right. This is what we're seeing. So the web is the thread, the weave, right? And so we'll get this passage in Proverbs. Remember who does the weaving? In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. We also, and that's her weaving at her loom. We also get um, the women who would go uh, to the um, upper pool. We did a study on this. And wash the wool out with the fuller's soap. So it was the women who were responsible for creating the body and also for keeping it clean. We see that described in these particular two passages. But we're also going to see a lineup here with the peacock angel to this character of Lilith. Now, the Yazidis believe in a divine triad. Um, do I want to read this part? Because there's quite a bit to read and I don't want this. This is just a quick little video for anybody who wants to go in and look at this information is quite interesting um let me see here okay so we will start in the second paragraph here in the Yazidi myth, myth of creation Tawasi Melek now I'm going to start saying the peacock angel just because it's going to be easier for me than to say this term. So in the Yazidi myth of creation, the peacock angel refused to bow before Adam. What's a peacock? A peacock's multicolored. You know what that means? It means variegated, doesn't it? Possibly like a variegated robe or a coat of many colors. So we see Joseph wearing this coat of many colors, but we've also identified that up in the North Kingdom, which was Joseph, is also called Ephraim and Israel. That's the North Kingdom, not the South Kingdom, which was called Judah. But we identified that from the North Kingdom, from Ephraim, comes the firstborn daughter. Now, we've identified that for anybody who wants to reason and make sense and have a logical brain. Uh, we've reasoned that out. And we also see the bride, for anybody who goes in and studies the numbers, in Psalm 45 wearing a variegated robe, all right? Because the birthright is identified as a variegated robe, many color, right? And it identifies the birthright holder. And as such, the birthright holder belongs to the daughter of Israel. It always did. And she became the outcast that no man sought a covenant with. Now, we also identified that as Lilith, all right? In the Jewish belief of things. So here we're going to continue on with the peacock angel, the multicolored angel. So in the Yazidi myth of creation, the peacock angel refused to bow before Adam. Oh wait, I thought we read that exact same thing with Lilith. Yeah, that's what I thought. Only difference here is this angel, this peacock angel was gave full authority over the world. Much like when you get breaking down the truth in the Old Testament, daughter Israel herself was the authority on earth, the presence of God, whom man rejected. And as such, it identified her as, like I said, the birthright holder. So, and with Lilith, it says, Lilith refused to bow down to Adam, as she was instructed to do. A woman was never instructed to bow down to man. She never was. Um, it says, I will remove the name of Baal out of your mouth. He is not your Lord and Master. He never was. Um, I never told you to bow down to, to him. He's a sinner. You don't bow to a sinner. No, why would God want you bound to sinner? I thought God wanted you bound to God, and that ain't man. And God says as such in Isaiah chapter 14, you are not God, you are a mere mortal male. That's all God says. And we know that Israel's name means God wrestles. And why would God be wrestling? You flip God around, it becomes dog. Well, we know the derogatories on dog, don't we? And so it's their way, I think, of saying that God, the daughters of Israel, 
became the dog of man. Yeah, that's what I think. She also became the doormat. She also became the outcast that no man saw the covenant with. She also became the false foundation when she began to bow to Adam. So let's go back to Lilith and this character um, that we also find here weaved around the world in many, many different places called the Peacock Angel. So, the Peacock Angel refused to bow before Adam, the first human, when God ordered the seven angels to do so. Really? You think so? The command was actually a test, meant to determine which of these angels was most loyal to God by not prostrating themselves to someone other than their creator. And indeed, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You are to bow to your creator, to your God, not to your husband. This belief has been linked by some people to the Islamic mythological narrative of Iblis, who also refused to prostrate to Adam, despite God's express command to do so. Because of this similarity to the Islamic tradition of Iblis, Muslims and followers of the Abrahamic religions have erroneously associated and identified the peacock angel with their own conception of the unredeemed evil spirit Adam, uh, Satan. So what we've discovered about Satan, see we've, get, we've got this twist, this crooked path going on everywhere, um, is that Satan actually is another name for Adam, for Adam himself. And God says, you turned everything upside down, and you told the Creator that she, it says he, she has no power. That's what you told the Creator. But we have linked and associated the word Satan quite easy with Adam through first uh, Baal, 1167 <clears throat> in Hebrew. 1168 is Baal, and these two words are said to be the same word. 1168 is the same as 1167, except 1167 means your bridegroom, your husband, Lord, Master. All right. That word then links us to the New Testament, Beelzebub. And from Beelzebub, it'll tell you that this is an idolatrous idol to bow down to. Not getting it? We're also told it's also a name of Satan, the leader of the demons, or the leader of the devils. We're told that of the devil. It's another name for Satan. It all links back, and it, that Satan means the accuser. Well, the first Adam did this exact thing. He accused his spirit, uh, which was the first wife and the original spirit of the original covenant that he rejected and cast down and married the daughter of the strange God, we're told in Malachi 2. Is it Malachi? Yeah, I got it right that time. Malachi 2. You dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth and married the daughter of a strange God. That daughter was a harlot that bowed down to man and became the false foundation that everything in this world then became founded upon, right? Woman bound to her husband as Lord and God and Master, and you don't see it because you refuse to go in and study the truth. God says, my ways ain't your ways. You don't understand love. You understand what you think is love. It's not love. God says, you don't understand me. God says, none will be gave in marriage, none will be taken in marriage. You don't understand love. You don't. You think you do. And uh, God says, this web of lies that you built and you weaved and you weaved so many lies together can actually be broken apart. And that's what God says in Isaiah 25. And she will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil of lies spread over all the nations. So we see this is going to happen. So we're going to go back to the Yazidism. Sorry. And what else does it say? Um, I was in paragraph two. So the command, okay, in you, okay. When God ordered the seven angels to do so, to, or, to bow to Adam. So the command was actually a test meant to determine which of these angels was most loyal to God. Um, so they link it to the Muslim name, of course, Iblis. 
And then they associate the peacock angel with the unredeemed evil spirit Satan. Well, that's a lie. These are very two separate distinct characters. The peacock angel would actually be the daughter of Israel herself. And Satan is actually fallen Adam who accused her in the garden. That's what we realize. So we do see a semblance of truth, and yet we see a, a bunch of lies holding, right? A misconception which has incited centuries of violent religious persecution of the Yazidi as devil worshippers. Well, we all are. We all are. By bowing to Baal, our husband, our bridegroom, our lord, our master, our savior, we're everyone devil worshippers because that name husband Adam links right back to the devil, the accuser, Satan. So I guess we're all devil worshippers. Persecution of Yazidis has continued in their home communities with the borders of modern Iraq. Yazidis, however, believe that Tawa, okay, the peacock angel, is not a source of evil or wickedness. They consider him, no, her, to be the leader of the archangels, and she was. Not a fallen angel, and she wasn't. She was cast down by fallen Adam, and Satan exalts himself, and he daily accuses her in the courts of heaven, right? Until she finally stands up for herself, as we've discovered on this channel. Uh, Yazidis argue that the order to bow to Adam was only a test for the peacock angel. Since if God commands anything, then it must happen. In other words, God could have made her submit to Adam, but gave the peacock angel the choice as a test. Okay, so you understand God's time is much different than our idea of time. So though it appears the peacock angel as really the daughters of Israel now cast out in the lands of the Gentiles to bear the sins of the Azazel goat, right? Tell Israel her warfare is ended, right? That she has received double for all of her sins, for bowing to a religious lie that Adam was your God, that he's your master, and that your bridegroom saves you and washes you in blood. So, but understand the time frame for us is very different for God. So six days to God is 6,000 years to us, right? Seven days to God, of course, is 7,000 years for us. So it's a great test to us. While in God, God's just waiting to see if this angel's going to turn back. And we know that she does because it says, Return, return, O Shulamite. What might we see when the Shulamite returns, as it were, the company of two armies? That two armies is the 144,000. First fruits, daughters then called she-goats, which are then known as the lilies of the covenant or the daughters of Israel, reborn out in the lands of the Gentiles. So, where was we? Okay, so the Yazidis argue that the order to bow to Adam was only a test for the peacock angel, since if God commands anything, then it must happen. In other words, God could have made her submit to Adam, but gave uh, the peacock angel the choice as a test. God had directed her not to bow to any other being, and her refusal of the latter order to bow to Adam was thus obedience to God's original command. And that's exactly what it's about. It's about us bowing to the true living God who gave life to us and not to a lie. The Yazidis of Kur Kurdistan have been called many things, most notoriously devil worshippers, a term used both by the unsympathetic neighbors and fascinated Westerners. The sensational epitaph is not only deeply offensive to the Yazidis themselves, but quite simply wrong. Non-Yazidis have associated um, this long name or Satan but Yazidis find that offensive and do not actually mention that by name. Okay, so we're going to continue on here. So who else um, got passed over because she wouldn't bow? Lilith, right? Lilith refused to bow the first wife she's called. Well, we identified that as one of the lilies of the covenant or the daughter of Israel herself refusing to bow. 
And so then they tell us, well, then Eve was made to take her place. Yeah, just like Esther in the book of Esther, right? Vashti, which means most excellent woman, was passed over by the king because she refused to bow to a drunken man and let him drool over her like she was nothing more than a harlot. What come in? A child taught by a man had a bow to a man. That's what come in. We see that actually lining up with the word study that we did in Lamentations 4 verses 1 to 3. We see it all lining up. Because what we know in the book of Esther, that the king then decrees that every wife will bow to her Baal, her husband, which is a religious idol, we're told in the Bible, <laughs> our accuser, that every woman, every wife will bow to her Baal. That's right, in the book of Esther. And nobody gets it? You don't get it? Oh, wow, it's all there. So, we're going to scroll down here, and we're in the, the heading here, Seven Angels. So, the Seven Angels, which is in the Yazidism, okay, the religion of Yazidism. Uh, did I say it right? Um, so, the Seven Angels are the emanations of God, which are said to have been created by God from, it's not His own light, Her own light. From Her own light. In this context, they have, so to speak, a part of God in themselves. Another word that is used for this is, and it gives the word S-U-R or S-I-R-R, -R, which literally means mystery. So where do we find that? When the mystery of God is revealed, it will be revealed when the seventh trumpet sounds. Well, that seventh trumpet we identified as that mighty angel taking back her birthright with her foot standing on the water and the other foot standing on the land as the daughter of Israel herself taking back her birthright. That's right. And she's also this mighty trumpet sounding the truth and the mystery. So it's interesting that we get the word mystery here. Another word that is used for this is literally mystery, which denotes a divine essence that the angels were created from. This pure divine essence called the Sir or Sir, Sir has its own personality and will and is also called the Sura Exude or the Sur of God. This term refers to the essence of the divine itself, that is, of God. The angels share this essence from their creator who is God. The seven angels are sometimes referred to as the seven mysteries. In Yazidi literature, these angels are referred to as, and it gives them a whole bunch of names, and the most important angel of these is known as the Peacock Angel. And the others are better known by the names of their humanly incarnations, representations, and then it gives a whole bunch of names here. So, let's see, was there anything else we wanted to read? I'm just showing you the web of lies that they've got weaved around this globe. Let's look at rebirth and conception. This was exactly um, going to line us up with what we see um, spoken of quite broadly in the Holy Bible with passages like what we find in Isaiah 59, which we've already read, but we'll read it again after we read this. So it says, yeah, this is rebirth and concept of time is the heading we're under here. So the Yazidis believe in the rebirth of the soul, like the aha a heck, I can't say it. The Yazidis use the metaphor of a change of garment. Oh, really? A change of garment, like somebody else, right? Like the Christians do. To describe the process, which plays an exceptional role in the Yazidis' religiosity, and is called the change of one's shirt. We, we've seen that with the Shulamite, or her in uh, Job... 30, 31, she says, my, my, um, my coat binds me a boat. Um, so we get this, this same allegory repeated over and over. There is also a belief that some of the events from the time of creation repeated themselves in cycles of histories. Now, we, we've seen this in the Bible. There does seem to be a cycle going on here, a repeat, a repeat of events over and over. Um, 
So in Yazidism, different concepts of time coexist. So an esoteric time sphere, this term denotes, denotes a state of being before the creation of the world. And according to the Yazidi cosmogony, there is God in a pearl in this stage. So a cyclic course of time, it means literally change or changing or turning or revolution. There we go. With changing, return, return, oh Shulamite, a turning, right, back. Um, and the Yazidis' context denotes a new period of time in the history of the world. Therefore, this is key, it may also mean renewing or renewed and designates the start of a renewed period of time. So what do the occultists tell us? Oh, the age of Aquarius. Well, what was the age of Aquarius? Really, when you get looking in the Bible, well, we know the well of water comes from the wife. We know it springs your wife, the, uh, the gar garden, your spouse is a garden sealed, a fountain shut up that springs like water from a well. We see her identified as the water also in Proverbs chapter 5. The wife of the original covenant was to where you were to find the true living uh, law or uh, commands of heaven at her mouth and they rejected her. So therefore it may also mean renewing and you are transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Stop thinking so archaic, okay? and designates the start of a renewed period of time. A linear course, and it's funny because we looked at this eight cycle, and so we look at a cyclic course of time, and that means literally change, changing, or turning back. So she's turning back. So a linear course which runs from the start of the creation by God to the collective eschatological end point. So we're going to look at that maybe with the war scroll if I can ever get to it. And I'm still looking at the covenant. Uh, I haven't made much headway on it. Just what I originally had. Um, and I'm sorry, I apologize for how much time I'm taking on this. Um, but I guess it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, and I have to give God the time, uh, the Holy Spirit, the time to show, or at least give ample time um, to where I believe that God has shown me what God and the Holy Spirit wants me to see. So, three storm flood catastrophes. It is believed that there are three big events in history. Um, okay, so I didn't really want to read all that. What I wanted to do was to show you in Yazidism that their metaphor of a change of garment to describe this process of the rebirth of the soul. And we get this in, like I said, in Isaiah and 59, what does it say? It says, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands, and it is. This whole world is founded upon a religious lie, laws, uh, yoking us under violence, a system of violence, and that was never God's way. God says, my ways are not your ways. Um... And so we see all of this. We see that she's the weaver of the body. I know it goes into more detail here. If I could find it um, right quick. Let me see if I can. Let me just go in here. Um, oh, come on. And then I'll just read this and then I'm going to go. Because I just wanted to show you when the Bible speaks of this weave of lies that cannot hold together. And she says, I'll tear this dark covering down. This is what we absolutely have to do. We have to tear this web of lies down. That means going in and looking at things that nobody else will. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so it's down here. Okay. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself carvings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. She maketh fine linen. 
See, she weaves the clothing. Not him. They're also the ones that went up to the upper pool, as we're told, where they would wash the wool with fuller soap. And it was the women who did this. And we studied that. So, there, it's all referencing the feminine. It is so. And anybody who studies and quit letting the men of Belial, the sons of darkness, and Baal, hubby, tell you what it means as opposed to what it really does mean and going in and discovering this web of lies for yourself. Um, or you can keep playing man's harlot and bound to the religious lion law and you'll get precisely what you want. A man ruling on over you in heaven just like you've got on earth or a continuation of it because there's no man coming to rescue you. Um, that was the religious law that they built up to empower themselves. And um, it's everywhere. You will find it embedded everywhere. And only when you go into the Old Testament and you realize that the cornerstone rejected was the daughter Israel herself holding her mother's law or her mother's commandments on her tongue from heaven so that we might be permitted in the heavens. Um, then do you realize uh, this web, this weave, and that it is akin to a body uh, that cannot be rebirthed um, or the soul that cannot be rebirthed because you are refusing to renew, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, it's either too low for you to grasp, I guess, in, in some ways. Uh, God says, my ways ain't your ways. They're actually very simple to understand. Um, or because it is so simple to comprehend it, just whoosh, right over your head. You know, it's one or the other. Um, but anyway, there's the video. I just find it absolutely fascinating. And these are just small little uh, parts of this weave. But God says, I'm going to tear your web of lies down, this dark covering over the world, uh, that you've got so many believe in this lie, that don't make an ounce of sense. Your ways ain't my ways, they never were. And your ideas of love uh, can't even attain to what my ideas are of love. And um, you fell in love with this um, lie. And you think it's love. You've been taught a lie of love. A love of lies. I don't know which is it. You love the lies, do you? Um, and yet all you got to do is look around you and realize the truth. Open your eyes. Um, God says, your ways ain't my ways. This covenant that you've got in the land saying it's from me, it's not from me. None will be gave in marriage. None will be taken in marriage. And that right over your head. I've heard different comments of people saying, well, I want to be married. I want to have children. And yet God says, that was never my covenant. That's not what I stated. And um, we speak of the crucible um, in uh, the War Scrolls when we get to it. And this idea of it being a, a, an eschatological war. Eschatological war. And if I get the chance, I'd like to at least go over the first ten pages. It'll probably be broke down into two videos if I can get to it. I'm just having such a struggle with so much work. I have quite a heavy workload on me right now. It's just so difficult to get the time to even get a short video up. Um, though this one's a lot longer than I intended it to be. So I thank you for watching my videos. Uh, I pray the Lord, the true Lord, the true Holy One, blesses you with an abundance of her truth and her words. And um, I hope you all have a really nice day. And thanks again for watching.